welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. In October, Yemen's government and Houthi rebels in the north failed to renew a truce signed in April. UNICEF now reports that 62 children have been killed or injured since then. It has urgently called to renew the truce, which reduced the intensity of the violence. Many independent reports have said such deaths and injuries are an extreme form of Yemen's humanitarian crisis. Millions in Yemen need the world's attention and billions in aid. Abdul from People's Dispatch brings us more details of the UNICEF report and the chances for peace in the region. Abdul, hi. Uh, good to have you on the show again. Uh, Abdul, we've discussed Yemen on our show many times before. Uh, what does the new UNICEF report say? What are the problems people face in Yemen? Well, uh, UNICEF head was in uh, Yemen for uh, a trip. Uh, and uh, after the trip, she basically came out with a, a report in which she was basically narrating what is the condition on the ground. The basic data is already there, of course, that there are around 2.2 million Yemenis children out of around 13, 14 million, which are basically uh, on the verge of starvation. And they are basically because of the starvation, because of the malnutrition, they are not in a condition to face the kind of uh, uh, attack of the various diseases. Uh, uh, and, and, and that can basically be uh, fatal. Apart from that, she also mentioned that there is a, a severe a lack of vaccination, the regular vaccination, which most of the uh, children around the world are, uh, have been going through. Though they, they have been affected due to the COVID also. But because of the war in Yemen, uh, a large number of uh, children have been basically deprived of their regular uh, vaccination. So their immunization is basically weak. And that makes them further uh, uh, susceptible to different kinds of diseases uh, which can ultimately lead to death. And uh, even during the time of the ceasefire, the death of children did not uh, uh, decrease, though it decreased, but the decrease was not substantial. And particularly after the ceasefire was uh, broken uh, uh, in October, since then more than uh, 60 uh, children have uh, further died. So the overall condition, when it comes to the, uh, on, uh, on, on the level of the human suffering, uh, in Yemen is uh, uh, quite uh, well known. When, when we talk about the children, uh, it, uh, the suffering becomes a manifold more. And this, basically this is affecting the future generations of the country. And it seems that the effect of the war will continue for many generations to come. That's basically the gist of, of the report uh, uh, of Catherine uh, Russell, uh, uh, which, which was presented uh, yesterday. Abdul, now the thing is that, you know, the death of children, a very stark reminder of the crisis in Yemen. Um, but, you know, everything seems to hinge, in, according to the UNICEF report, on peace. What are the chances of that taking place? Well, uh, as we said earlier, there was a, a, a rare ceasefire which was agreed in April uh, this year, which was extended twice. It was for two months and it was extended twice. It means the, for six months, there was some kind of uh, ceasefire uh, in Yemen, which was rare because in the last seven years, we have not seen, we have never, uh, we never saw such uh, a duration, a long duration in which there was no active uh, hostilities, uh, at least the, uh, the, uh, the declared formal host hostilities. Uh, uh, but since then, uh, the ceasefire has uh, broken down uh, and primarily the responsibility for that is basically uh, the UN, which basically for six months, uh, there was a period in which it could have forced the parties, uh, could have convinced the parties to agree for a long term uh, ceasefire. It failed to do so. And, and basically, it seems that the UN failed to address that, uh, that its failure is primarily rooted in the idea, uh, in the fact, sorry that uh, the UN failed to uh, address the basic demands which were raised by the Houthis, the, uh, the affected uh, parties, primarily because the international coalition led by Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries have, are the aggressors uh, in, in Yemen. And uh, uh, the UN failed to convince them to lift the blockade. Uh, the blockade, uh, which is a, a comprehensive uh, blockade, uh, uh, nothing can reach Yemen 
through sea, through air, through land, without the permission of the Saudi-led coalition. It is illegal act. And despite the fact that it is illegal, it, has, it is causing a massive humanitarian suffering in Yemen. Well known, uh, this is a well-known fact. UN failed to convince the Saudi-led coalition to lift the blockade completely. And that was the re basic reason that the ceasefire uh, uh, broke down uh, uh, in October. And ever since then, there has been no serious attempt taken by uh, the UN to address this basic demand. So I think until this basic demand is addressed, uh, the, the, uh, the blockade is lifted. Uh, there is very rare possibility, very, uh, very uh, dim possibility that there will, there, there will be a, 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 a long-term ceasefire or, or there will be a talk to basically address uh, the conflicting issues between both uh, between the parties. So the first priority should be to basically uh, 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 convince Saudi-led coalition to end its illegal blockade on uh, on Yemen. Right, Abdul. Uh, since we have another couple of minutes left, I thought I'd ask uh, you know a small follow-up question. Now, there's also the UNICEF report also tries to bring attention to the fact that the Yemen conflict, the conflict in Yemen, is simply ignored. And that there will be a large amount, large sums of money are required from the world to actually, uh, you know, bring uh, some sort of relief to people. Can you talk about that as well? Well, uh, uh, UNICEF report talks about the lack of funds. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the world is ignoring it primarily because whatever targets the international agencies, the UN agencies are setting for the required funds to provide the humanitarian aid through uh, uh, buying food, medicine, and other essential commodities, uh, the, the, the amount it fixes, uh, it needs basically, that it is never able to get it for various reasons. In last three, four years, we can understand there was a COVID situation which basically hampered uh, the flow, to, uh, flow of aid to Yemen and other war-affected, conflict-affected reasons. But uh, this is not only limited to the COVID period. We have seen that since last seven years, whenever the UN has given a call, there has always been a lack of a fund. For the uh, a prime reason behind that is the war, uh, Saudi-led war is uh, uh, supported by uh, countries which are also the primary donors in, uh, in most of these uh, situations. Uh, so uh, uh, the lack of fund in Yemen is basically indicates towards a, a more structural reason uh, uh, which basically causes the war and conflict in the world. And uh, so uh, the, 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 the occasional aid which, which is provided by the countries, which themselves are the aggressors in many of the cases, which basically becomes a, a, a stopgap arrangement and, and, and it is affected when they themselves are the party of the war. So that needs to be addressed. And, uh, uh, and so uh, I think that is the basic uh, reason, basic, basic issue here. Yeah. Right, Abdul. Thanks a lot for joining us with that update. 150 members of political parties, trade unions, women's groups, community organizations and social movements from West Africa are meeting in Winneba, Ghana. They've been sharing the demands and aspirations of the region's people. The first West African people for a new world conference is all about why the region is underdeveloped and how to mobilize people to control their own destiny. Prashant from People's Dispatch is at the conference and he joined us for a brief discussion. Okay, Prashant, uh, thanks for joining us uh, from pretty far away from Delhi right now. So, um, can you just begin by laying out the groundwork, the context of this conference, why people are there? Right, of course, uh, Pragya, the conference just concluded on uh, Sunday. And it was a very interesting conference because you had uh, people from... Uh, People's, uh, people's movements, political parties, trade unions, women's organizations from across West Africa, gathering to sort of have a shared analysis of what is happening in the region right now, uh, to sort of devise joint strategies for working together, to sort of see how they can pool in their resources and their strength together and present, you know, a plan of action, so to speak. So uh, the... Uh, Direct result of this, of course, was the formation of what is being called the West African People's Organization or WAPO. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of work that has gone into it. But I'll just, uh, we can come to that a bit later, but I can, I'll just explain the context in which this has happened, which is that, uh, you know, West Africa right now is in the center of multiple crises. 
the most obvious one, of course, being the fact that uh, whether you call it a crisis and opportunity is a different thing. But uh, the fact that there is there seems to be a large scale resistance to uh, imperialism, to foreign intervention, especially a very strong anti-French sentiment that is prevailing in many parts of what you would call Francophone Africa. So we know that there have been coups that have taken place in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Guinea, and in many of these by, of course, army officers. But these military juntas seem to be riding on a wave of popular discontent with the French. Uh, you know, the French came to this region saying that they were here to combat Islamist insurgency. Now, we do know that the Islamist insurgency was fueled, first of all, by the NATO uh, destruction of Libya. But even then, uh, despite their coming, despite them bringing soldiers to the region, there's very been very little success. Now, many parts of various countries still under the effective control of such groups. And the people are increasingly angry with the French for making these claims coming here. And then it does seem like a lot of it has to do with the region's resources as well. So there's been this move, and Mali has now ejected the French, the strong sentiment in other countries as well. So this is one crisis. There's also a massive economic crisis. You do know, for instance, in Ghana, where the conference was held, has been uh, undergoing a very difficult time economically. It has had it's taken its 18th package with the IMF. And you know what IMF packages bring. We've talked a lot, lot about it on this show. Uh, there are environmental crises that are pretty uh, that, that are quite serious in this part of the region as well. So, uh, you know, there's this a series of uh, crises. And in just to sort of mention imperialism a bit more, there's also the increasing understanding that uh, the, the US, the British, the Germans, uh, the French, all of them have some military presence. In fact, I think one of the people I spoke to pointed out that except for the Italians, all major European powers are directly militarily present uh, in North Africa and West Africa. And, you know, the, his analysis, of course, was that uh, now uh, it seems that colonialism by force seems to have returned to the continent in some form. Uh, so this is the context in which this conference was held. Prashant, what is the sort of plan of action that people are coming up with? What are the demands? What are the expectations here? Right, I think so. There are multiple uh, aspects to consider. Of course, one is that there is a rejection of the presence of these kind of foreign military forces that I talked about. And, uh, you know, so there is an understanding that this uh, this is actually uh, important. And, and also, of course, of various uh, Islamist and jihadi elements, many of whom have been imported uh, from West Asia. In fact, the organizations of the region directly blame uh, these imperialist powers for uh, the insurgency. So that's one thing that has been that, that's been very clear on everyone's minds. There is, uh, you know, an understanding that, uh, say, among the the gov governments of many of these countries have been acting as uh, proxies in some senses for the imperialist powers, uh, for, you know, and have been pretty much, uh, you know, for instance, there's talk of the ECOWAS, which is the Block of West African states sending military, you know, asking, making a demand for the return of direct democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, even talking about a military force. So all these kind of issues are, uh, they, they, they may cause a lot of concern among the people. Uh, the movement, interesting, the, these groups, interestingly, have expressed very firm solidarity with struggles of the people of Cuba, Palestine, Western Sahara, for instance, which itself is very important because internationalism seems to be a very powerful theme among all the organizations which gathered in Ghana to talk about many of these issues. There is the understanding of intensifying popular struggles, of bringing together more people, of presenting alternatives which are radical, of presenting alternatives which improve people's lives. So all of these are also actually key parts of the uh, you know, presentation, uh, the discussions that are, that are taking place. The final documents are still yet to be out, of course, but these are some of the important themes that uh, you know are very strong in the minds of the people. There's been a call for, for instance, a common currency as well, which in some senses goes against the French CFA. Uh, right, you know, right. we, we, you know, which is actually a huge sore point for many people uh, in the region. So, very important, uh, uh, you know, conference in that sense. In the sense that there's been this process among organizations in Africa of building unity of uh, of bringing together of coming bringing together common demands many of these organizations previously working in their countries but now the attempt is to move beyond just country specific or sectoral uh, say understandings <clears throat> and then see if it could be a more regional understanding and regional strategies with of course every country having its own specific context so i think these are some of the uh, interesting aspects from uh, this the conference that took place and uh, I think in the West Africa People's African People's Organization, 
in the coming months and years is trying to sort of expand its contacts to across the region as well you know have dialogue with more organizations of this sort and it's an interesting initiative because you know we often hear only about uh groups of countries like g20 or you know ecowas right. or you know or shanghai cooperation organization brics all of them have their own of course important some of them are more progressive some of them are outright uh dangerous to the world but it's always interesting to see when people's movements also come together uh with a very similar agenda of how to present an alternative to what uh you know capitalism and the west's militarism uh, is imposing on the region right prashant thanks a lot for joining us will morocco go the whole way at the fifa world cup moroccans are hopeful but face france next and that's no pushover There's Argentina and Croatia to contend with as well. The first Arab nation in the finals is bound to make the news, but we asked Sadhant Ane who is in Qatar how realistic its chances are. Thanks for joining us Sadhant. Uh, Sadhant as we edging closer and closer to the uh, final. Uh, looks like Morocco has reached further than many would have thought it would. Yeah, everyone I think except uh, the Moroccans themselves. Uh, the line I've been hearing Pragya here Uh, on the streets when talking to moroccan fans is why not <laughs> you know so every time you ask them anything can can you win the next game why not can you beat france why not can you win the world cup why not <laughs> so so it's been uh, that kind of a tournament and and i have to say if there's one person who if there were an award for uh, you know like there is the the most valuable player of the tournament uh, or the most valuable person in general in the tournament it would go to uh, walid uh, regrawi who is the coach of the moroccan team he has been absolutely phenomenal uh, whether it, it is in terms of because he came in you know very very uh, not not so long ago uh, only about 80 days before the tournament started okay and uh, uh, like we were talking earlier a lot of these players who are uh, you know from the diaspora who are born outside of morocco and had had different kinds of fights with the football federation as well as uh, the media in morocco in the past he has brought them back into the team and and instilled this kind of uh, real i mean i know we say it a lot and of course it it is a team sport so you have to have a collective spirit but morocco have displayed that uh, above and beyond i think any other team with the exception of perhaps france in this tournament and uh, then you know it's like the decolonize the world to like someone was calling it uh, they they been spain first they be portugal after that and and next up is uh, france who also have a, a you know interesting colonial relationship with morocco uh, but they're for... not quite through yet right we can't just write off no, no, the no, next not, yeah they're not through at all uh, the, they play the semi final against france and it's going to be extremely extremely difficult for them uh by no means uh, should be assumed that morocco are going to win this game france are the overwhelming favorites they've shown that uh, at this tournament they are the be- they are the defending champions world champions uh, and they are the best team in, in this tournament uh, it has to be said from all perspectives the most balanced the most put together uh, the most tactically sound uh, but uh there's a little bit of a pattern you know in 1998 the world cup was held in france france won it uh but as far as these so called underdog teams are concerned in 2002 japan and korea co-hosted the event and then and they became made improbable runs uh, beating italy and all of that making it to the semi finals uh in 2010 ghana came very close uh, the world cup was held in south africa Uh, and then this time it's the first world cup in this region mina the middle east and north africa maghreb uh, and you know morocco have gone and done it and a lot of it has to also uh, go down to being of course familiar in the surroundings and all of that uh, with the weather with the food all of those things but also with the massive amount of support that they're getting both on the ground as well as in the stadiums that's the kind of spirit there is here on the streets everyone is in morocco colors now it's like everyone's adopted a uh, nation uh, you know we found and we found across uh, this part of the world and e- and even beyond uh, it means a great deal to uh, to i think all muslim people who play the sport and who have had a tr- troubled relationship with it because there are a large number of top top professionals who are of uh, the, the islamic faith 
uh, and yet somehow it's always considered uh, some kind of a hurdle or a challenge to them becoming their best uh, selves as athletes not something that actually aids in the process or or is just a cultural factor and doesn't have any impact at all either ways you know it's always been looked at in a certain way so we've been seeing reports over the past few days of kids in london and belgium and spain uh, and you know and how they uh, look at themselves and their cultural identity uh, and how this moroccan team is kind of redefining that relationship uh, in the context of football we can't so forget sadan that this is uh, despite all the years gone by it's still a post 9/11 world absolutely very much so and the, the, those divides are are, are very clear uh, so yeah it it is a factor and and it and hopefully this is one of the things that you know we keep saying football can be this vehicle for change and, and to change attitudes and all of that and with all the negativity and the issues around the qatar world cup which will not go away for some time uh, and we will get back into discussing some of those in the next couple of days while while the, the news cycle is still hot and we still have some space to talk about it uh, but uh, at the same time we should be looking at some potential positives at least and and this is definitely one of them uh and it's also an immensely likable team you know uh, they have star players and all of that but 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 no superstars and and it's just been like a straight up uh, tactically very solid technically very good but but like just the fight and the heart that this team has shown to get to where uh, they have um uh, i think they believe they can go one step further if not uh, all the way right sadant great uh, thanks for joining us and that's all we have for you today thank you for watching daily debrief we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow you will find more such stories on our website peoplesdispatch.org and you can find us on facebook twitter and instagram